Being a girl who plays video games can be pretty tough sometimes. Note that I said girl who plays video games and not bloody gamer girl since that term seems to be now irrevocably associated with dirty bathwater and a twitch thought turned scam artist. That's just one of the things you get. Others just assume you're trash at the game because of what's between your legs. The only time I ever get any real respect from guys is when I prove I'm actually good at the game we're playing. Not that all guys are like that, I'd actually say that most don't really care that I'm a girl, but when it gets bad, it gets really bad. And sometimes, that's all it takes to ruin the experience for me completely. But there was one incident that occurred while I was playing online that put me off gaming entirely for quite a while. This is the story of Twi'lek Zane. I met Twi'lek Zane one night on Sea of Thieves. For those that don't know, Sea of Thieves is an awesome multiplayer game where a crew of two to four players take control of their very own pirate ship. I was a huge fan of the Disney Pirates franchise when I was a kid, still am I suppose, so the idea of a game like that was hugely appealing to me. I had a lot of fun on Sea of Thieves, for a while anyway, until one night I found myself on a ship with a crew member called Twi'lek Zane. Zane, as we'll call him, was nice at first. He seemed a little surprised to find himself sailing with a real-life girl, but a lot of people are and just get over it pretty quickly. Zane seemed like one of those guys, kind of quiet but perfectly nice otherwise. He kind of faded into the background for the most part, being overshadowed by much louder, more extroverted crew members that ran around showing off their pet parrots and playing their musical instruments. At one point, after fighting a ship full of skeleton pirates, I needed to regenerate some health. So I go below deck to our little food barrel and pick out a few pineapples to nom on to get myself back to full strength. I made a remark to the guys about eating all the ship's pineapples and how it was making me hungry in real life. They asked what my favorite food was and my reply is probably in line with like 80% of people everywhere. Pizza, I told them. This sparked off a little debate on ship when one of the crew threw the question out there. How do you feel about pineapple and pizza? Now, unlike most of civilized society, I actually kind of liked Hawaiian pizza. I just can't resist the whole sweet and salty thing that it has going on. But when I tell them that, this sparks off something of a mutiny. The two louder crew members start laughing and one even jumped off the ship, saying he refused to sail with someone who liked pineapple and pizza. It was funny, sure. We had a few laughs. All the while, Twilight Zane stayed quiet, not saying a word as we had our little bit of banter. About 45 minutes go by and I'm getting hungrier and hungrier, so I tell the guys I'm about to jump off to go make some food and that I'd be back on afterward. Then I hear my doorbell. Luckily, my flatmate was home, so I didn't have to worry about rushing off to answer it so I don't really take much notice of the exchange I can hear through my bedroom door, but I did start to take notice when I heard my flatmate's footsteps coming up the stairs to my room. As she opens the door, I slide off my headphones and there stands my roommate with a pizza box in her hands. It was a godsend to trust my BFF to just know when I was hungry. Or at least, that's what I thought. I was so hungry that I actually cut her off and asked her if I could have a slice of her pizza as I was absolutely ravenous. She looks confused and says she was about to ask me the same thing. I'm beyond confused at this point so I asked the guys on Sea of Thieves to hold on a minute. I mute my mic then turn back to my friend. My jaw is on the floor by the time she's finished talking. The pizza delivery wasn't for her at all. It was for me. What's more, it had been paid for and the topping was, you guessed it, ham and pineapple. I felt sick. I told my friend she could have it that I wasn't feeling very hungry anymore. In a confused voice, she thanks me and turns to leave but asks me if I'm feeling okay before she shuts the door. I just lie, straight up lie and tell her I'm fine, just a bit under the weather I suppose. When she shuts the door, I get right back on the PC. It was horrible. I found myself asking a question that I already knew the answer to. Did one of you guys order me food? The first two louder sailors said no, with one actually laughing at what seemed like such a bizarre question. But Twi'lek Zane was silent. 
his character just stood still on deck, quietly watching and listening as the situation unfolded, and then he spoke up. Enjoy. Is all he said. I freaked out. I pulled the Ethernet cable out of the back of my computer so hard the connection snapped off and remained in the slot. But it was severed, and that's all that mattered. But it was way too late, and that was the worst thing of all. There was no way for me to know just how much information Zane had acquired just from using my Microsoft ID and IP address. If he managed to work out my home address, what other information had he been able to dredge up? The only comfort I could possibly take in the whole thing was that, because of his accent, I knew he was North American. But that didn't rule out the possibility that he was either living or studying in the UK and was actually much, much closer than I first thought. I barely slept the week that followed. Nightmares came every single night. Nightmares in which I'd wake up to a figure standing over my bed, a crooked smile twisting their lips before they pounced. I'd wake up crying, bed sheets soaked in a cold sweat with my roommate rushing into my room to see if I was okay. In the end, I told them everything and they drove me down to the police station immediately. There I spoke to an internet safety officer who was overloaded with cases just like mine, but all they could do was tell me to block the person in question, to possibly avoid the same game as them, but generally to carry on as normal. Basically, there was absolutely nothing they could do. And that's what's so scary, that maybe the internet will never be a safe place for girls like me. No matter what we do, there will always be people whose predatory attitudes seem to override all normal human feeling. The most terrifying day of my life began early one morning in 2015. I don't want to give away too many details. I don't want the person at fault here to be able to gain any satisfaction from this retelling, so I apologize if I seem overly vague when it comes to describing people or places. It all started one afternoon when I decided to unwind after work with some video games. I live with my brother, who finishes his daily shift a few hours after I do. It was his console, so from about 3.30 to 6 p.m. every day, I can actually have that thing to myself without the danger of him claiming it back to play Call of Duty, which he obsesses over. Driving games were more my things, still are I suppose. I'm a real gearhead and it was my dream to live out in the California coast, so I guess you can call it escapism. That and the idea of beefing with people over voice chat just didn't appeal to me. But as I came to learn, sometimes it's simply unavoidable. So, I'm winning round after round of this particular game when I start getting griefing messages from some salty moron. They weren't happy that I was using a setup that they called OP and demanded I change my settings to see if I was skilled enough a driver as I thought I was. I sent him back a lull, told him no, and carried on playing. Next round finishes and this time a flurry of messages start pinging their way towards me at an astonishing rate. I don't know if this guy was using a USB keyboard or whatever, but the grief came thick and fast. At the time, I just thought it was funny how anyone could get so irate over something as small as a video game was beyond me. So, as you can imagine, I just sent a few messages back telling the guy how pathetic I thought he was being. Then, the guy just rage quit, or at least I figured he had. He wasn't in the game anymore, and from what I could tell, he was either offline or had blocked me but he did send one final message before he did. You deserve what's about to happen. Rest in pieces. I have to admit, this did creep me out a little. Although I was mainly worried about him, like hacking the console or something. Like I said, it was my brother's and he would not be happy if someone screwed up his COD sessions. However, a few hours go by, there's no problem with the internet connection or the console so I figured the guy was just full of hot air and was just trying to scare me. And I just sort of forgot about the whole thing. I remember briefly telling my brother about it when he got home and he thought the whole thing was funny. But other than that, yeah, it just didn't register with me. We had dinner, watched a little TV, shared some beers and then went to bed. The usual routine. The next thing I remember was being shaken awake by my brother. 
There was no light coming through the cracks in the curtain, so I had no idea what time of night it was. But as I'm slowly rousing myself from a deep, dreamless sleep, the fear I heard in his voice had my heart going from zero to sixty. Wake up! There's people trying to break in! He hissed. When I looked, I saw he had his pistol in his hand. He was deadly serious. This was no dumb prank, and I could see from the look in his eyes that our lives might actually be in danger. Everything was kind of a blur after that. He hadn't called the cops yet. He'd rushed into my room right after he grabbed his gun, so that was the first thing I did. I grabbed my phone and immediately called 911. It's in the middle of explaining to the dispatcher that we were in the middle of a home invasion that I heard my brother scream something about the guys outside being armed. They send me into overdrive. I was pleading with the woman on the other end of the line to send help, but when I told her our street address, she seemed to get all cagey. Right when I was panicking the most, she asked me to hold the line. Instead of reassuring me something, anything to let me know the help was on the way, she literally said, Hold the line, please, sir. And then silence. Silence until I heard the shots. Five of them to be exact. Something that's completely burned in my memory. The distinct pop, 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 pop that I described to the police over and over again. Then there was screaming. My brother barking at the invaders outside. He'd shot at one of them and his aim had been true. There was more screaming too. My sister-in-law was hiding somewhere in the house and was wailing with panic now that the shots had been fired. I was so scared I just ran to my closet, crouched down and shut the door. I tried to keep as low as possible while staying on the line with the dispatcher, but each second seemed to drag itself out into an eternity as all I could do was wait and listen. Then I heard the words that made my jaw drop and had me hanging up the phone immediately. This is the police. Put down your weapons to surrender to the officers immediately. Not exactly what was said, but I won't reveal exactly that because they use my real name. I remember seeing my brother on the stoop outside, his hands held high in the air as a few extremely bright lights illuminated and blinded him. I was convinced they were going to kill him. I mean, the shots he'd fired, the ones I thought were aimed at some violent intruder, he'd shot at the freaking cops. Not just shot at them either. He hit one. I know he did. A bunch of times too. As far as I was concerned at the time, he'd killed a cop and how was he not dead himself? They arrested my sister-in-law and I and took us down to the station. I had no idea what was about to unfold. I was convinced my brother was about to get life in prison for killing a cop. But the truth of the matter and how that situation ended was something I never could have expected. We came to find out that my brother was facing absolutely no charges. None. He had fired at a cop, and I was right. Had in fact hit them, but was still facing no charges. It was all because of that video game I'd been playing. The salty guy who was messaging me had somehow found out my IP, then used that to pin down my social media details, which he then used to find out my address. Then, he waited until the following morning to swat us, which... He did so with horrifying efficiency. Long story short, because the cops hadn't followed protocol and announced themselves properly, my brother had no idea it was them, hence why he opened fire in the first place. The cop he shot was wearing a state-of-the-art bulletproof vest, military style with armor plates, each round hit the plate, so other than some bad bruising, the cop was able to walk away. That night was probably the worst experience of my life, but I still play video games. Whoever it was that almost ruined our lives will never have the satisfaction of thinking he had put me off gaming. I still play, every night almost, and I will continue to do so as long as I'm able. I'm a headphone connoisseur, always have been, always will be. I also play a fair amount of online video games too, ones where it's pretty crucial to have clean, crisp audio. And games where you're reliant on hearing other players' footsteps, having that kind of audio quality gives you a real edge over other players. That's why I had my heart set on a Bose A20 Aviation headset. 
They were without a doubt the best gaming headphones on the market, and at a $999.99 set price point, just shy of $1,000, they took a lot of work to afford. I had to work 10 months at a local gas station, including weekends, saving just a few bucks each time until I could finally afford them. But when the delivery guy finally dropped them off and I carefully unboxed them and plugged them into my iPhone for a music test, I discovered they were well worth the wait. The depth and range they produced were absolutely phenomenal. I heard songs in ways that I'd never heard them before, but most importantly, I couldn't wait to see how they improved my gaming performance. A few hours later, a buddy of mine and I were playing a game called Hunt Showdown. Apologize for the tangent, but it's an absolutely terrifying experience. Set in the swamps of post-Civil War Louisiana, the game has all kinds of monsters to hunt and take bounties from, but not without a little competition from other players. There's heavy emphasis on stealth, sneaking up on other monsters before mercilessly dispatching them and robbing them of their prize. Hence why I was so excited at using such high quality audio gear. I was certain it'd give me and my buddy a crucial edge. I was only partially right. The quality of the headphones just made the game all the more terrifying. I could hear every little footstep, every creak of a door opening or a rifle reloading. At one point, I was about to ask my buddy if he'd opened a door in the place we were hiding out. I turned in time to see a figure in black, holding a fire axe above his head. Rory, I screamed down the mic, as the sickening crunch of the axe impacting with his skull echoed around my ears. It was intense, seriously intense, and it was every bit as amazing as I imagined it could be. So obviously we spent hours hammering round after round, and... Not once did I take the things off. Usually after a few hours wearing a pair of headphones can get kind of uncomfortable, but these things had foam padding on all kinds of places, ergonomically designed not to cause any kind of discomfort. I swear I could have worn those things all night, just plugging the wireless connector into the phone, TV, laptop, anything and everything. I was actually kind of disappointed when it came to the end of the night and my buddy logged off to sleep. I stayed up for a few hours, testing out each game I had and seeing how the new headset enhanced the audio, and not once was I disappointed. I remember finally logging out and taking the headset off before checking my phone. I had like four or five missed calls from an unknown number, and my phone wasn't even on silent. It had been ringing and vibrating over on my coffee table at multiple times throughout the evening, and not once had I heard so much as a peep from it. That was seriously impressive, and... I knew that every penny spent on that headset would be worth it. Only that's about the time my phone buzzed again, the same unknown number text popping up on the screen. It was the sheriff's department, and on the other end of the line, a female deputy was asking me if I had been home that night. My first thought was to wonder just how they'd gotten my number, but I guess the cops just have access to that kind of info. But I answered the lady's question and told her, sure, I've been home all night. That answer seemed to confuse her quite a bit. All night? She asked again, and again I reiterate that yes, I've been home all night. When I ask her why she was calling, she just answers a question with a question. We've had deputies hammering on your apartment door for the last four hours and you didn't hear us. Not even once? Then it hit me. I'd had my new headset on. Not only that, the volume was way up on them. Not an usual thing I do, but like I said, I was testing them out. I sighed before I started on my long-winded explanation as to why I hadn't heard them calling. I felt kind of dumb having not heard them and actually wondered if I'd been in danger at any point, totally oblivious to the home invader attempting to break in, all while I'm just sitting there, gaming, in total ignorance. Only when I asked what had happened... It was worse than I ever could have imagined. There had indeed been a break-in, only it obviously wasn't my apartment, it was the one above. A guy had busted into the apartment of the girl that lived there with the intention of robbing her. According to the cops, she resisted, tried to fight the guy off, but hadn't gone well for her, not in the least bit. The home invader had tortured her at first, trying to get her to confess where she had money or jewelry hidden. When it turned out she didn't have any, he beat her to death in frustration. This whole thing had happened without me hearing so much as an iota of noise from above. 
I'd been sat there happily playing PC games and someone had been getting murdered above me. If only I'd taken them off for five minutes. If only I'd stopped fawning over them for a little while, that girl might still be alive. It took me a while to get over it. I moved out of that apartment and back into my parents' house, at least until I could find a new place to live. I also sold the headset too, not losing too much money in the process, but sometimes I feel like I'd have been happy to throw those things in a lake, even if I did work the better part of a year to be able to afford them. What makes it all the worse is that it wasn't some random accident. My greed, my own selfishness, that's what killed that girl. That scumbag psychopath might have been the one that murdered her, but I was the one that nailed her coffin shut. I've been a gamer for as long as I can remember. If we define art as producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power, then surely by this point in time video games are actual works of art. Maybe not so much back in the days of Doom 93 or Mortal Kombat, when the only visceral reaction to be had was when Scorpion pulled a dude's spine out along with his skull. But try telling anyone who rolled a silent tear at the end of Red Dead Redemption 2 that the almost 60 hour emotional roller coaster they just went through wasn't a work of art. Yep, you can't. Not only because art is entirely subjective, with the beauty being squarely in the eyes of the holder, but because the work itself fits in perfectly with the agreed upon definition of the word. Like many gaming aficionados, I had a great deal of affection for what I refer to as the undiscovered gems of the video game world. Games that were just too bizarre or obscure to make it into anyone's radar. The kinds of adventures that were pure labors of love, created by some neckbeard genius still living in mom's basement. I even got hold of a copy of the legendary Polybius, writing an in-depth review of the video game turned urban legend for my website. That is before I had to take the entire thing offline. You see, in my search for the most twisted, disturbing horror game imaginable, I found something quite different, but nevertheless terrifying. Something which crossed the boundaries of imagination and into reality itself. So, one way I'd find games to review was to trawl the depths of online forums, forums like Reddit. I'd peruse comment sections, make my own query posts, anything I could to find the strangest, most disturbing video games imaginable. I had a good run for a while, but it wasn't long before I was really scraping the barrel for things to review. I was getting desperate, and right when I thought I'd be without a review one week, I got a direct message from an anonymous account. To cut to the chase, the message stated that there was an old MMO, a massive multiplayer online game, that I might be well interested in. The public servers for this game were long dead, but apparently there was a private server which a small group of dedicated enthusiasts still regularly visited. The message sent from a throwaway account stated that the author would be extremely grateful for any further information regarding the occupants of the private server. According to them, they'd had a friend that had somehow gotten access to the server before seemingly disappearing entirely from their online spaces. Emails, Steam, and Discord accounts for this person had been completely deleted and the person had even gone so far as to stop answering their phone before it was disconnected completely. I had to be completely honest here. I didn't believe a word of the message. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is, and I applied this exact line of logic to the message's contents. If I could put the work in, the review might end up being the best I'd ever created, but to have it just pop up in my inbox seemed way too easy. So I asked the sender if he minded having a brief Skype conversation so I could make a few notes on necessary details. If he sounded disingenuous or if I heard laughter in the background, I'd know it was an elaborate prank. Only, it wasn't. When I finally got the guy on the phone, he was so genuine it almost scared me. He was extremely worried for his missing friend and told me the whole saga. The police had done a welfare check and declared him fine, even though he was living alone and barely venturing out of the house. When he traveled across state lines to visit the guy, he'd refused to see him. I suggested hiring a private investigator if he was truly concerned for his friend's safety, but he replied that he couldn't afford it, hence why he was turning to me. 
The more we talked, the more I was hooked into the guy's story. One of the sort of trick questions I asked him was if he believed there were any supernatural elements at play. He sounded almost offended at the inquiry, batting it away as if he'd grown frustrated at people doubting his story. It was around then that I realized that I had no other option than to investigate. My first task was to download the game itself. This was easy enough, and I actually managed to get a hold of a pirated copy, obviously free of charge from a torrent site. The Secret World billed itself as a massively multiplayer online role-playing video game set in a modern-day real world under attack from occult forces. Nothing out of the ordinary so far. But it Accessing the private server was another issue entirely. It could only be done by entering the server number into the game's command code. The guy I had spoken to had given me the number itself, but had been unable to access it himself because he didn't know the passcode. Again, I took to Reddit to try to find the passcode. When Reddit failed to yield an answer, I tried Tumblr, but that too led to nothing. I ended up posting on a few different sites, including my own, inquiring if anyone knew the password or had any way on working it out or hacking through it. And that's when I received his message in my professional Gmail account. Avoided by all, but feared not by the brave. Yet without me, there'd be no one to save. Doers of evil have plenty to give. However, without me, you'd struggle to live. A riddle. Someone had sent a freaking riddle, and yes, I was kind of freaked out to see it appear in my inbox. It took me a little while to work out exactly what the answer was, but I shuddered when I did. Pain. The answer to the riddle was pain. And I know it was the correct answer because when I plugged that four-letter word into the command line in the game when prompted for a password, the screen went black and one word appeared on my screen. Loading. I was practically shivering with anticipation by the time the server loaded in, but when it did, it appeared there was absolutely nothing special about it at all. As far as I could tell, it was completely empty. At least that's what I thought. I plugged in my headset and switched on the mic, giving a few quick hellos as I wandered around the renderings of empty city streets and buildings. Nothing. No replies, no other voices, no sign of any activity whatsoever. Just as I was about to give up on the whole thing and log out, a voice emanating from my headset almost made me jump out of my skin. I turned my character around to find another standing behind me and, after taking a deep breath, gave him the friendliest greeting I could muster. He totally ignored it. How did you get in here? The voice asked. I'm not quite sure. I lied. I was looking for a full server and just kind of came across this one. There was no response from the Avatar this time, and I got the strong impression they knew I was lying. Follow me, the voice said. And so I did. I followed the digital character through empty streets and alleyways until we reached the very edge of the map space. I was led up to two lone trees, the bark pale and white. They look more like bones than plant life. Stay close, the voice told me, and began to walk between the true trees. Suddenly, the voice's character disappeared. I called out after him, but again got no reply. Whoever it was was just screwing with me. That much was clear. How wrong I was. I walked through the gap in the trees and found my screen turn black. Slowly, light returned, and I found myself standing in an underground chamber, filled with many other game characters. I was asked by the same voice as before. I stand among them and repeat every word he said. I just did as I was told. I was in too much amazement that there seemed to be an actual cult here operating in a private server on a long dead MMO. I am the lamb, the voice said. I repeated it word for word. I am the lamb. I am the blood. Again, I repeated the words. You are the blade. It took me a second, but I echoed his words. Louder, the voice ordered. I knew this was not for me to repeat, it was a command, so I said it louder. But again and again, the voice demanded I say the words louder until in the end I was practically screaming, you are the blade, down my headset. That's when I heard something else entirely. 
It was a sound I'd heard before on elementary school field trips to petting zoos many times over. It was the bleeding of a lamb. He is the lamb. He is the lamb. He is the lamb. All the other voices seemed to chant in unison. But as they did, the soft bleeding became more and more distressed, until the poor thing was practically screaming over the microphone before it began to choke and gargle. I'm almost certain I could hear the cutting, slicing sounds of a knife cutting through flesh meat. And that was when I lost it. I shouted something along the lines of, What are you people doing? What is this place? Down my mic, backing my character up so I could look at all of them. But not once did they cease their chanting. About the same time, I could hear something dripping coming from one of the other users. I was hammering Alt F4 as fast as I could, trying to just end the program so I could get out of there. But that's not where the story ends. As soon as I had time to compose myself, I tried Skyping the guy who'd been in touch with me about his missing friend. I had no idea how I'd break the news to him that what was going on in that server was anything but healthy or natural, but I knew I had to. His friend's mental health or even his life was at stake and the sooner he knew, the better. But when I tried calling, there was no connection. The user's contact information wasn't even my contacts anymore. Either they blocked me or had deleted their entire Skype account for some reason. Now I was really freaked out. Had these people gotten to the guy who called me? Had they somehow managed to silence him and were about to pursue me now instead? Or, and I was filled with dread as the thoughts occurred to me, he was part of that group the whole time. That there was no missing friend. How it was just a ruse to get me in that server and make me say all that freaky stuff to begin with. The Reddit account that had sent me the pain riddle was also deleted. Could it have just been the same guy, leading me down the garden path and making me think it was all out on my own? When in reality it was all just part of a sick plan. Thoughts like that fried my head for days until I was finally able to sit down, compose myself, and write out a few thousand words describing the experiences I'd had. My usual readers were fascinated by my account, although a fair few tried to call me out on making the whole thing up for clicks. According to them, if I didn't have screenshots or a recording of the whole thing, it didn't happen. I assured them it had, that I was just too taken aback by the whole thing to remember to run a screen capture program or take any screenshots. I actually ended up editing the post to say that, no matter if people believe me or not, they were under no circumstances to try to access the servers themselves. Not long after I received a three-word email, take it down. The words had a picture file attached, one that was just a straight-up Google Earth street view of my own apartment complex. So I did. I took the post down. Not only that, but I deleted my website along with the hundreds of time-consuming reviews I put so much work into, all gone in a few clicks of a mouse. I tried to do the same with my online presence in general, creating whole new email and social media accounts with absolutely no clue as to who they belong to. That seemed to stop the harassment and thank God no one ever vandalized my property or tried to ambush me outside my home. Although I sometimes get a feeling that someone or a group of people have been to visit once or twice just to make sure they know where they can find me. I suppose this whole thing is intended as a warning. I open with saying that video games have evolved from something very simple into something very, very complicated and deep, that their purpose has changed over the years, sometimes in ways we can't fully understand. Many aspects of human criminality have moved online, such as the Silk Road, so why would it not be the same thing for the occult? And even if they do worship something ridiculous and archaic, something that isn't really real, that mightn't even matter. Because what was real was the sick skin-crawling feeling I felt when I realized that they really were torturing and killing animals together, even if it was via meetings in cyberspace and not in some deep, dark woodland somewhere at some grisly sacrificial altar. Stay safe, everyone, especially when you're online.
In 2017, just three days after Christmas, a group of young American men are playing a new Call of Duty game set during World War II. The young men were using a website known as UMG, or Unorganized Management Gaming, in order to organize matches in which there were bets placed. Obviously, whenever money is on the line, even if it is relatively small amounts, intensity and competitiveness go into overdrive, and this is no different when it comes to video games. Two of these gamers, named Casey Viner and Shane Gaskell, were playing together on the same team when an incident of friendly fire occurred. Due to confusion, frustration, or both, one of the players ended up accidentally eliminating their own teammate for the proceedings. This meant that each man would each lose $1.50 that had been placed as a wager. In a distinctly unsportsmanlike follow-up, the two players took to Twitter and began to argue amongst themselves, each blaming the other for the lost match. This is about the time that Casey Viner threatened to swat Shane Gaskell. Swatting is a criminal harassment tactic of deceiving an emergency service into sending a police and emergency service response team to another person's address. This is triggered by false reporting of a serious law enforcement emergency, such as a bomb threat or murder or hostage situation, or a false report of a mental health emergency, such as reporting the person is allegedly trying to end their own life or someone else and may or may not be harmed. The term derives from the law enforcement unit SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics, a specialized type of police unit in many countries carrying military-style equipment such as door breaching weapons, submachine guns, automatic rifles, and sniper rifles. A threat may result in the evacuation of schools and businesses, or sometimes even graver consequences. Like many of you, Shane Gaskell was very familiar with the concept of swatting as a phenomenon with an almost decade-long history. He was never about to give away his actual address, but he also didn't quite believe that Casey Viner had it in him to commit such a destructive, irresponsible act. So he simply called his bluff. Gaskell gave Viner an address in Wichita, Kansas, that had an element of truth to it, since it was the residence that a Gaskell family member had previously called home, 1033 West McCormick Street. As it turns out, Gaskell was right. Viner did not have the mental faculties to swat his one-time teammate, but he knew someone would. Tyler Raj Barris was 25 years old and technically homeless at the time of the incident. He was known throughout online gaming communities as SWATistic, a portmanteau of the acronym SWAT and the word autistic. But Barris was also known to law enforcement for quite another reason as he had once served 16 months in the L.A. County Jail for making false bomb threats against local TV stations, elementary schools, and middle schools throughout the greater L.A. area. He was wanted by police in Florida for calling approximately 30 other bomb threats, and also wanted up in Canada on fraud and mischief charges, as well as online harassment of a woman in Calgary. Using a system known as Voice Over IP, Barris was able to use the free Wi-Fi provided by a South Los Angeles library to call the Wichita Police Department. This is a crucial piece of information in what unfolded, given that the voice over IP technique used by Barris meant that the call would be transferred from Southern LA to Wichita City Hall, meaning that, from the perspective of the dispatcher in question, the call appeared to be coming from the city of Wichita itself. There was absolutely no reason to suspect the call's authenticity as as there may have been if it was evident that the call came from California. Barris, identifying himself as Brian and claiming he was calling from 1033 West McCormick Street, went on to tell the dispatcher that he had fatally shot his father and was holding family members at gunpoint. He asked if police were coming to the house, saying he had already poured gasoline all over the house and was threatening to set it on fire. Over a thousand miles away in Wichita, local police officers scrambled into action. It is unclear why the city's actual SWAT team wasn't called into action, but the most likely explanation is that given the seemingly urgent nature of Barris's call, senior officials made the call to simply get to the scene as quickly as was physically possible. Any later, and the fictional Brian might set about burning his own family alive. And so, a handful of police officers were not SWAT team members and therefore untrained for tactical situations or hostage rescues, responded to Barris's call and surrounded the house at 1033 West McCormick Street. 
Meanwhile, in the house, 28-year-old father of two, Andrew Finch, was going about his evening as normal. The Finch family were no strangers to tragedy as, just a few years prior, Andrew's sister had died suddenly in a horrific car accident that had left Andrew as guardian of her teenage daughter. That might seem like enough heartbreak to last a lifetime, but that night, tragedy would once again visit itself upon the Finch family. Andrew, the man of the house, always took his role as his niece's guardian very seriously and, upon hearing a noise outside in the street, went out to investigate. To his utter shock, he was greeted by red and blue flashing lights, unable to see the men who screamed at him to show them his hands. One can only imagine the terror and confusion experienced by Andrew Finch that night, the contradictive emotions of knowing those heavily armed cops were screaming at him, yet knowing full well that he hadn't done anything remotely illegal. However, Finch knew the only rational thing to do in that situation would indeed be to comply with the officer's demands and raise his empty hands calmly and slowly. Yet for some unknown reason, Finch didn't throw his arms up all the way. It's likely that he was turning to tell the other members of his family to stay indoors since it was already an obviously tense and dangerous situation. But this would prove a fatal mistake as police officers later stated that his movement appeared to mimic that of retrieving a firearm from a hip holster. A single shot was fired from a police issue AR-15 assault rifle, one which pierced Andrew Finch's heart and right lung. He collapsed right there on the porch a steady flow of blood pumping from the hole in his chest. Finch's traumatized family members were forced to step over his bleeding body as the police ordered them out of the house. Andrew Finch was driven to Via Christi Hospital St. Francis, but was pronounced dead on arrival. To the attending officers, they had done their job almost perfectly, diffusing a dangerous hostage situation in mere seconds and rescuing all vulnerable parties. But that could not have been further from the truth. As police questioned Finch's family members down at the station, the truth began to come out. In the aftermath of the shooting, outraged Wichita residents used the opportunity of a city council meeting on January 9th to voice concerns on the subject. They questioned the release of only seven seconds of the police body cam footage and argued that the city should assume full responsibility to avoid a lengthy struggle by the Finch family for justice. The council did not comment directly, but indicated a willingness to consider training procedures at a later time. Nearly a week later, Andrew Finch's mother Lisa wrote to the Wichita mayor and police chief stating that she did not know where her son's body was being kept and that she wanted to give him a proper funeral service and burial. Please let me see my son's lifeless body, she wrote in a letter dated January 3rd. In the same letter, Mrs. Finch asked why the police officer who killed her son had not at the time been identified, why the family was handcuffed in the immediate aftermath, and when police will return their belongings, including two cell phones and a computer seized from the house. The family attorney, Andrew M. Stroth, has also called for the city, police department, and officer involved in the shooting to be held liable for the unjustified shooting of Andrew Finch. On December 29th, just a day after the Wichita swatting incident, Tyler Raj Barris was arrested in Los Angeles on a fugitive warrant stemming from a 2015 charge of making false bomb threats to KABC, a local TV station. He was then charged with false alarm, which happens to be a federal offense. In the investigation that followed, it was discovered that Barris was responsible for potentially hundreds of swatting incidents all over the country. It wasn't long before investigators discovered a connection between him and the Wichita swatting incident. Communication channels were opened between the California and Kansas state governments, and on January 12, 2018, Barris was extradited to Kansas where he was charged with involuntary manslaughter and was held in Sedgwick County Jail. As the extent of Barris's criminal activity was being unearthed, investigators turned their attention to the police officer who fired the fatal shot. Justin Rapp, a seven-year veteran of the force, was identified as the officer who had killed Andrew Finch. Attending court in May of 2018, Officer Rapp testified that he had been given absolutely no information when he arrived at the scene, including when Finch was given his first verbal command when the 911 call ended, or whether officers at the scene were aware the caller was still on the phone with 911. 
Sedgwick County Department of Emergency Communications had also denied an open records request pertaining to the 911 call, stating the police department had asked that no more records be released. It was clear that, despite firing the shot that killed Andrew Finch, Justin Rapp was simply doing his job. If the hostage situation had been a genuine one in which Finch was indeed threatening to kill his family, Rapp would have legitimately been a hero. It was only because of malicious intent on the part of a complete stranger that the shooting even occurred in the first place. As a result of these testimonies, the Sedgwick County District Attorney, Mark Bennett, has announced that no charge would be brought against Officer Justin Rapp. On May 23, 2018, Tyler Barris, Casey Viner, and Shane Gaskell were indicted in the United States District Court for the District of Kansas on charges related to the swatting. Viner was charged with wire fraud, conspiracy to make false hoax reports, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. In April 2019, he pleaded guilty to conspiracy and obstruction of justice. Then, more than a year later in September 2019, he received a 15-month prison sentence in addition to two years probation, during which time he would be banned from playing video games. Gaskell was charged with obstruction of justice, wire fraud, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. However, in July of 2018, as his trial unfolded, a horrifying revelation was revealed to the court when it was announced that Gaskell had encouraged Barris to try again. Apparently completely undeterred by the death of Andrew Finch on the night of the 28th of December, Gaskell gloated that he had not been successfully swatted. This could easily have caused yet more deaths in what was a pathetically petty war of words between two man-children. Gaskell's case was originally scheduled to go to trial April 23, 2019. If convicted on all charges, he was facing over 60 years in prison. In September 2019, it was reported that Gaskell struck a deal for deferred prosecution that could allow the charges against him to be dropped. For the previous two defendants, the charges only really reflected their involvement in the Wichita swatting incident, but for Barris, the arrest led to his entire criminal past coming back to haunt him. He was charged with false information and hoaxes, cyberstalking resulting in death, making threats of death or damage to property by fire, interstate threats, conspiracy to make false reports, and wire fraud. However, on October 26, 2018, a whopping 46 additional charges against Barris were added, which included financial fraud, and fake threats of bombs and shootings made to police and schools. Some of these charges included unindicted co-conspirators residing in Illinois, Florida, Michigan, and Missouri. Just two weeks later, on November 3rd, he pled guilty to 51 federal charges. Under the terms of his plea agreement, Barris has also been required to formally apologize to Finch's family and pay $10,100 in fines and restitution, and has agreed to five years of supervised release. On March 29, 2019, Barris was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The sentence includes 150 months imprisonment for the Kansas case and 90 months imprisonment for the federal charges in California to be served consecutively, and 30 months in prison for the Washington, D.C. bomb threats to be served concurrently. No officer was charged with a crime for the event, but the tragedy didn't end there. On the 9th of January 2019, Adelita Finch the daughter of Andrew Finch's deceased sister who entered her uncle's guardianship after her mother's death, shot herself in a South Wichita apartment. Andrew's mother, Lisa Finch, said she blames her granddaughter's taking her life attempt on the events of that fateful December evening when Andrew was shot to death by Wichita police. Because Adelina was made to step over his dying body and she had to hear him breathe, Lisa Finch said, and she's been going downhill ever since. She didn't know how to handle it. She had internalized everything. If somebody even mentions Andy's name, she withdraws and walks out of the room. She's not been able to deal with it. I guess this was the way she was dealing with it. Adelina Finch had been a certified nursing assistant and wanted to get more education to become a registered nurse, but thanks to the trauma inflicted by Tyler Barris and others involved in the swatting incident, her aspirations would never be realized. 
Numerous pieces of legislation have been passed in recent years to prevent such incidents from ever occurring again. Some police departments have gone as far as training their dispatchers to be able to recognize hoax calls and the kind of people likely to attempt them. Yet passing laws has never been able to suppress the desire or ingenuity of people who simply want to hurt their fellow man. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord, interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And shout out to Riley Reed.